Let me just take a minute and tell you why I'm here, because my own background and testimony is, is quite different. And then we'll open the scriptures together, and, and I want to encourage you in the time that we have. So throughout my ministry over the years, I've preached on holiness and sexual purity. But just from the background as a heterosexual believer, if I talked about sin issues and things like that, it was adultery or pornography, etc., and as far as the moral and cultural issues, they weren't on my radar that much. Uh, the first 19 books I wrote, if you take everything that I said about gay issues and things like that, perhaps it would take up one page if you put it all together. So I didn't come out of homosexuality myself, never dealt with same-sex attraction. That's not part of my testimony. And we had a family member that was close to us and uh, met him subsequently, married into our family, and he had come out of homosexuality when he got saved. He just gave his whole life to the Lord, including his sexuality, and to his shock, found his desires changing. And, but even then, I had no particular burden or sense of calling to be addressing these issues. And it was only in 2004, after we had relocated to North Carolina, that God began to burden me about the social issues, the, the moral and the cultural issues. And I felt a real burden to help push back against what was happening in our society. And I very quickly saw that, that gay activism was becoming or had become the principal threat to freedom of religion, speech, and conscience in America. That was clear already in 2004. In fact, it was clear to me at that moment that we lost the culture wars for the generation without divine intervention. Now, to me, that was not discouraging. Rather, that was encouraging because I had to put my trust in God and not in man. In other words, Lazarus does not need an aspirin. Lazarus needs resurrection. So that's, that was where I started. But I didn't just want to be concerned about issues. One pastor said to me the other day, when, when our generation, older generation, hears the word homosexuality, we think an issue. The younger generation hears that they think a person. And we're dealing with people and we're dealing with issues, and in this context here, primarily with people. So I did my best to put myself in the shoes of those I was differing with. I would ask local activists, hey, could we have a meal together? And I'd tell them, tell me your story. I want to hear your story. I would read all the literature I could from gay activists and gay theologians and gay pastors and talk about what they went through and so on until my heart was breaking on their behalf. I remember one night just putting one of the books down and just getting alone in my room and weeping and saying, God, I don't want to hurt people. I want to help people. And I knew that the stances we would take on social and moral issues and, and saying that we didn't recognize these relationships as being valid and right in God's sight, that we'd be viewed as, as hateful enemies, homophobes and bigots. And, and God broke my heart for the people and gave me a clear word, reach out and resist. Reach out to the people with compassion Resist the agenda with courage. Reach out and resist. We need hearts of compassion and backbones of steel. And, and often we have one or the other. And we forget that Jesus comes with grace and truth. It's not grace or truth. Compassion and courage are not opposite values. So today as, as you are on the front lines of a battle you never asked for, as those dealing with unwanted same-sex attraction or unwanted gender confusion are, are now about the most targeted, attacked people in the country. One of my articles, I said that, that those dealing with unwanted same-sex attractions are the, the smallest, most despised minority in America today. So the very place you didn't ask to be in the front lines and right in the focus and crosshairs of a culture battle, here you are. And those standing with you, here we are. So I want to give you a word of encouragement and faith and hope today. Amen? And Father, we look to you and ask you to speak, Lord, as you've been speaking through this conference and through the testimonies and meeting with us in this beautiful worship. We ask for a word from heaven to bring courage and strength and faith and hope afresh. In Jesus' name, amen. Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, a passage you've often heard in this extraordinary vision in the midst of the book of Revelation, John writes, then I saw 
in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Now this is a, a drama taking place in heaven, and it's one of these mystical visions in the book of Revelation, but, but there's a little lesson along the way, which is before the victory comes, and before God manifests his presence, before Jesus arises in power, there is that time of despair and hopelessness and weeping. I mean, I, I wish it wasn't the case, but there's no resurrection without crucifixion. The testimony we just heard from our sister would not have any depth to it if not for the pain that she went through over so many years. It's those who sow in tears who reap in joy. Weeping may endure for the night. In Hebrew, it's, it's literally just lodged for the night. But joy comes in the morning. So there are those seasons where things look bleak. You can count on it. You can expect it. In fact... The many times that God tells you not to fear in Scripture gets you wondering. <laughs> you know, I, I fly constantly. It was just in Israel for a few days, back home for a few days, then Italy for a few days, and then back home and then here. I fly constantly. And actually, I enjoy traveling, enjoy flying. It's for the gospel, and, and I use the time productively when I'm on planes and things. But, but if, if five different people called me with prophetic words right before a flight and said, Mike, don't be afraid. I'd start to worry. <laughs> but, but this is reality. Th this is life. Children are born through much labor and travail. So there are seasons when things look bleak and look dark. It's going to happen in our personal lives on larger scales. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll in its seven seals. The first thing that I want to say to you is, is the foundation of all of our hope and the reason for all of our courage is that the lamb has triumphed. That the lamb of God is the lion of the tribe of Judah and that he has triumphed. Look, I don't like trite Christian expressions and sayings. I never have. You know, and you, and you put on the, the back of your car a bumper sticker, I'm not perfect, just forgiven because you're a bad driver. I, I never like that. <laughs> never impresses me. And, and, you know, when people say, I looked at the end of the book and we won, ha ha, and everybody gets excited. But there is reality to this. It, it is spiritual reality. All I need to know in any ministry I'm doing, whether it's reaching Muslims, whether it's reaching religious Jews, whether it's standing against something that's wrong in our society, whether it's standing for pro-life, any ministry I'm doing, all I need to know is that Jesus is risen. That's the beginning and the end and the middle. That's everything I need to know. It doesn't guarantee a breakthrough today. It doesn't guarantee that the cancer is going to be healed or the person is going to be delivered. But it guarantees ultimate victory. And, and I was recently in Jerusalem and those of you that, that read my articles on a regular basis or watch our videos know what happened. But we were, we were doing videotaping, speaking to Orthodox Jews, but asking them questions that were going to air on Christian TV. And we told them that's what we were doing. But because I'm Jewish and look Jewish there in that setting, they didn't realize that I was in agreement with the, the, the Messianic, the Christian position. And even though we were telling them forthrightly what the shows were for, and then some guy came over and started yelling, missionary, missionary, which in Israel has a very bad connotation. It's, it's a bad word. And, and next, the guys we were working with needed to leave quickly because of the work that they're doing. They, they didn't need to be widely publicized. But I said to the couple of folks with me, I said, the last thing they're going to do is chase us out. And as long as they're yelling missionary, I'm going to stay right here. So I thought, well, let's try to exploit this. We were walking through this busy marketplace. And, and a lot of secular Israelis and then religious Jews, you know, with the long beards and the black coats and things. And I thought, well, let's just use this for the gospel. So I, as this guy's following me, yelling missionary and filming everything on his cell phone, I just began to stop and ask these, is this illegal? Is it illegal to believe in Yeshua here? Is it illegal to believe in Jesus? 
So, of course, you know, there's a whole swirling controversy here. And someone says, you better get out of here in one piece. Now it's like, no, I'm not gonna they're not going to chase me out. So the guy ended up calling the police on us. And he kept pushing the phone in my face. When I got right in my face, I pushed the phone away. He said, you assaulted me. Called the police. I thought, the last thing I'm doing is leaving now. So it ended up hours and hours. We went to the police station. I mean, hours and hours. I, they took my phone so I couldn't be in contact with anyone. And I'm sitting there right next to this guy, this, this accuser and all this. I thought, I might as well pray for him. I mean, we're sitting right here. we got nothing to do. i got no phone. He won't talk to me. I might as well pray for him. So I started praying God will make him a Saul of Tarsus and so on. And, and it, end, it ends up that, that you know, the, when the investigator finally comes in and talks the whole thing through with me, he just tells me to leave with a smile. Like, let's go. I said, he said, you need a lawyer? I said, do I need one? He goes, no. Let's go. He's with a big smile. I said, do we get paperwork? He goes, no, you didn't do anything. But the thing, the reason I tell you this is, is as these religious Jewish men are standing around me and, and they're yelling in Hebrew, we don't believe in Yeshu, the way he pronounces his name, and spitting on the ground because what they know of him is what they know of church history. And they associate him with the Holocaust and things like that. And when they read about him in their own literature, they read about him as some evil deceiver or diviner or sorcerer or things like that. So they have no idea who he really is. As they're there, spitting on the ground, saying they, they don't believe me, as, as this other guy's called the cops on me, I'm, I'm just thinking, I wonder how God's going to save these people in the future. I wonder, because Romans 11, 26 is all Israel will be saved. There's, it doesn't mean through all history, but at the end of the age, there's going to be a national turning. And just like you hear of Muslims left and right getting saved with dreams and visions and things like that, I'm thinking, when's this going to happen more and more with my people here? So as they're spitting on the floor and there's this whole uproar and it could be a riot and we could be attacked any minute. I'm just thinking, isn't this amazing? There's going to be a mass, mass turning of hearts and minds. Because Jesus is risen. Because the victory has been won. Listen, if everything completely collapsed in our society and the gospel was outlawed, Jesus is still risen. You understand? The, You know, there was a, a, an atheist rally in D.C. a couple years ago. Maybe they've had a couple of them by now. And they were expecting a much bigger rally, but maybe they got 15,000, 20,000 people. I just felt so bad for them. I mean, the first thing is if it's a beautiful sunny day, they can't thank anybody. You know what I'm saying? If it was pouring rain right before the rally, then it stopped. They, I mean, we'd be praising the Lord and thank you, Lord, for turning back the rain and all of that, you know. And if the rain came, we'd be thanking God. This is a sign of the spirit being poured out. You know, we'd have some, some positive spin on it. But, you know, they, got, they can't thank anybody. But I just thought how sad and how pathetic. You know, people just spitting in the wind ultimately. So, so we know the victory of Jesus. And, and that's what encourages us day by day. Not our own strength. Not our own wisdom. Not our own vitality, not the latest breakthrough in the courts. If there's a good decision in the courts, I'm glad. But I realize the next day there could be a bad decision in the courts. My faith remains in one place, and that makes that faith unshakable. Because it's not based on circumstance. It's not based, yeah, our emotions can go up and down. But the, the bedrock of our faith is the resurrection of the Son of God. And, and he not only resurrected, he ascended, and he sits at the right hand of the Father. That's all I need to know. I feel bad for those who oppose them. I feel, when, when people attack me, I feel bad for them because I know God's with me. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people of nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea 
and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. What's extraordinary is that Jesus triumphs over all the forces of darkness by dying. By being crucified, he now is resurrected. And, and you think of it. To a certain extent, Satan understands spiritual things, but in other ways he is spiritually blind. And whether he understood what was happening or what he was doing or not, his murderous rage is such that he was going to kill the Son of God. And by killing the Son of God, he thereby cooperates with God's great plan of salvation. When you have this confidence in the resurrection and ascension of Jesus, then even in death there is life and there is hope. And some of you have been through extraordinary loss, personal pain. And when you hear about it from the outside, you think, how could a human being go through that? How could you lose someone like that and live through it? How could you be walking on the other side of this terrible tragedy when you see it from the outside, it seems impossible? Or a Christian family forgiving the murderer of their child, you think, how is that possible? But that's where God gives grace. God gives grace in those difficult and impossible situations, and our hope is not based on what happens around us. Our hope is not based on the latest poll. Our hope is not based on human opinion. Our hope is not based on who's in the White House or not in the White House. Our hope is based in something that is unshakable and immovable and unchangeable. The resurrection of Jesus. That's, that's the first thing. And, and if you start there, you'll be steady. Because emotions go up and down and circumstances change and people are fickle. And someone close to you lets you down and, you know, all these other things happen over the course of life. And, and we let ourselves down, but he remains steady. He remains sure. He remains faithful. So I've, I've been walking with the Lord now over 46 years. And by God's grace, I, I seek to live a life that pleases him. I'm, I'm very serious about living for the Lord and honoring God. But in 46 years, I've learned something very major. I do not put my trust in Mike Brown. I put my trust in the living God. So that's the first thing. Second thing is this. Everything Satan means for evil, God can turn for good. We just heard a testimony. The very worst thing that happened in my life became the very best thing that happened in my life. And this is the way it often works. We talked about the crucifixion. So the, the greatest crime ever committed by humanity, human beings killing the Son of God, is God's means of saving those very people. Joseph sold into Egypt as a slave. His brothers mean to kill him or to hurt him, certainly to get rid of him. That becomes God's means for saving those very people. And Joseph says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good, for the saving of many lives. And I wrote a book, Outlasting the Gay Revolution, and the subtitle is where homosexual activism is really going and how to turn the tide. And one of the things I've felt for years is that gay activists and their allies, and then along with that more broadly, the radical left, they will overplay their hand. That I understand on the one hand our culture is getting harder and harder, hearts are getting harder and harder, things like polygamy are becoming more acceptable and you just go down the list of things we, we would have said never would happen and little by little public opinion is changing. I understand that. But, but you, you, now have, you now have parents who are saying it's not fair that my girl has to race against boys who identify as girls. And girls who are saying it's like the great majority is being sacrificed for the tiny minority. In other words, people wanted to be tolerant. They wanted to be accepting. They wanted to be loving. They wanted to be affirming of family members that were same-sex attracted or, or gender confused or things like that. But they certainly didn't intend to have boys showering in the girls' shower room in high school. And, and they weren't planning on Bruce Jenner being woman of the year. In, in other, and I'm not saying that all this is Satan is doing this. I'm saying the same principle. 
what Satan or circumstances or the world mean for evil, God turns for good. And, and I have believed for years that there will be an overplaying of the hand. That things will go too far. I mean, immediately when God called me to, to get involved in these issues and ministering to these people, um, immediately what I saw was those who came out of the closet want to put us in the closet. And, and I would be mocked for years. I'd be on a secular radio show or some other setting or TV, and I'd be mocked and people say to me, nobody wants to put you in the closet. And then a few years ago, the tone changed and people began to say, bigots like you belong in the closet. But it says things go too far. You know, often it was the, the martyrdom of believers in the ancient world that woke up the conscience of the ancient world. And they saw the way Christians died, and as Christians died honoring the Lord and with grace, it made them realize that their side was wrong. You know, I'm, I'm hearing regularly from, from our grads and friends working in the Middle East that, that radical Islam, while it terrorizes people and oppresses people, opens many people up to the gospel. Because they see that and say, that's, that's, not our that's not what we want. And then they see the Christians acting differently. There was one Romanian brother who came to the States, Joseph Tsan, or was out of Romania, and God called him back to Romania. And it was during times of communist persecution there. And the Lord said to him, I'm sending you back as a sheep, a lamb among wolves. And he said, Lord, what chance does a lamb have among wolves? And the Lord said to him, none. <laughs> but as they are attacking you and devouring you, perhaps they will see. In other words, as you live as a lamb, that may be the very thing that turns their hearts. And when he was being interrogated, and they were threatening to kill him. Basically, he said, that is the best thing you could ever do for me. That is the best thing you could ever do for the gospel. He said, because my, in those days, cassette tapes, he said, my tapes are all over the nation. He said, if you kill me, they'll now be baptized in my blood and everyone will want to listen to those tapes. And they were, they were afraid. Here they are, the police, here they are. They have all power over this guy. He has no power. They were afraid to touch him. A friend of a friend of mine was in Chicago some years ago when two guys jumped into the car to carjack his vehicle. One guy jumped in the back seat. The other guy jumped in the front seat, put a gun to his head. One of his money, one of the car, or they were going to kill him. And this guy reacted in a way they were not expecting. He said, you would do that for me? You would send me to be with Jesus now? Are you kidding me? Hallelujah. You would send me to be with Jesus? They got so spooked they ran. <laughs> Let me tell you something that just happened recently with me. We have a lot of videos out, over 1,300 videos on, on our YouTube channel on Ask Dr. Brown. And recently, we were just given a little funding to do some highly animated, very professional level videos. A new series called Consider This. We put the first two out, third's about to come out. And if you've ever seen the PragerU videos, which are so excellent and informational, educational, this kind of our version, but coming from a, a specifically evangelical or Messianic Jewish point of view. So the first one, because my ministry motto is avoid controversy at all costs. Hey, I'm from New York. Sarcasm runs in my blood. You just have to understand that. So the, the first video we put out is called Can You Be Gay and Christian? And it's six minutes long, and it's compassionate, and I try to bring the main arguments that would be brought by, by gay theologians, etc., and then counter them scripturally. And it's got fun animation the whole way through. And, and our conclusion is don't, don't put this in a special category, same-sex attraction. Just put it in the category of other fleshly issues we have to deal with. And, and don't, don't interpret the scriptures through the lens of your, your, your attractions and desires, but interpret your attractions and desires through the lens of scripture and find your identity in Jesus. Just simple gospel stuff. And there is forgiveness. There is hope of transformation. And 
we, we, we put the video out, so immediately we, began, we, we started getting lots of good responses to it because it was really well done by God's grace. The content was good and the, 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 the quality of the video was good. And for the first time, we had a little advertising money. We were donated some money that gave us a couple thousand dollars, a few thousand dollars to advertise. So we, we, we posted it on Facebook and got like 100,000 something views on Facebook, but we really wanted to get it up, out more on YouTube. So we, we get it out on YouTube, and next thing, something happened inadvertently. God knows it was not our intent. But because a couple of the words associated with the video, gay, homosexual, because of that, the video started getting advertised on different LGBT YouTube channels. <laughs> now, I found out about this two ways. There was a sudden flood of very negative comments. I mean, you know, once you begin to address these kinds of issues in areas that people are going to get very hurt and very upset. And I got to understand, I'm a Jewish believer in Jesus. I've been used to controversy from day one. We were moving into a new house and the builder said to, to, to my wife, Nancy, you know, the, the, my study was in a really nice setting. And she said, and he said, you know, this is really peaceful. It's going to inspire Dr. Brown. She said, no, controversy inspires him. <laughs> but that being said, I, I don't try to get people upset. I try to walk in love. I try to be a peacemaker. I reach out behind the scenes. But we're not going to compromise. If truth offends, so be it. Look, if Jesus was hated and crucified, w w why not us? He said the servant's not above his master. If that's how they treated him, he said we should expect that. And trust me, you'll never be more Christ-like than Christ. He was perfect and yet hated, despised, rejected. So I noticed this flood of thumbs down. Because when I looked, we were like 670 thumbs up and 70 thumbs down. And now suddenly the thumbs down were just going up, 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 up. And the vile comments flooding in and death wishes and death threats and profane blasphemous stuff. And, but I've seen it before. But this was a flood. And... and, and my, my producer to our radio and show and videos, he starts sending me links where this is now, here's a, a trans guy and, and it's, it's his site. And he's like, how did this ad end up in front, of my, in front of my video? So he starts playing it, playing clips of it, you know, and then commenting on it. And then another guy, and some of these have, you know, viral videos. You know, they're, they're very influential in terms of, you know, one guy has over six million on, on, on his uh, YouTube subscribers. And, and anyway... That caused the thing to then take off like crazy. And it wasn't our intent. I mean, the advocate, which is a flagship gay publication, even quoted me saying that was never our intent. I, to me, that would be intruding. You know what I'm saying? Like, you have a channel and you, people are going there for a certain reason. I'm not trying to intrude in what would be their safe space or their privacy. That, that wasn't my intent. That happened unintentionally. That was the first time we had advertised on YouTube. So it's just a matter of, okay, don't make sure certain words don't occur if you don't want it to go certain places, whatever. But I also knew that it was providential that it happened. Now, now check this out. As of now, from what we can tell, and some of these videos will play several minutes of my video. I mean, we could go after them for copyright content, but that's fine. Go ahead and do it. And they'll, they'll turn me upside down. They'll and somehow, I don't know why, but they'll hate my mustache. <laughs> well, yeah, it's... Come on, you get persecuted for everything. Mustache. Gosh. And then, of course, I get blasted day and night because I'm old. It's like, oh, so if I was some young, cool-looking guy with the same video, you'd love it? Oh, really? That's so if I just get somebody else to do it for me, the exact same video, they're going to love it. Slick, cool character. So anyway. So we have now estimated conservatively that the video or parts of the video have been watched on LGBT channels on YouTube more than a million times in the last two weeks. Just boom, just exploded. And then they're like, I can't believe they're posting them. We're going to take over this channel. We need more thumbs down. So we got a big Facebook following, like over 500,000 on Facebook. I said, hey, guys, we need some thumbs up. Join here with some thumbs up. And, and it's not for public. Ah, tell you what, go ahead. If you got the video, let's watch it. 
Can you be gay and Christian? Well, if you claim to be a Christian, then Jesus is your Lord and the Bible is your authority. So the real question is, what does Jesus have to say about this? What does the Bible, God's Word, have to say? Now, we know that every Christian struggles in some area, whether it be pride or anger or lust or jealousy or greed, but we also recognize that these desires and attitudes are, are sinful, saying no to them and yes to the Lord. In the same way, some Christians struggle with same-sex attractions, saying no to those attractions and yes to the Lord. But what about those who say, God made me gay, and if I'm in a committed relationship, then the Lord is pleased. After all, God is love, and love wins. And what the Bible opposes is, is abusive relationships like homosexual pederasty and prostitution and promiscuity. That's what Scripture condemns. But God blesses committed same-sex relationships. Is this true? Well, let's look at what the Bible, God's Word, has to say starting at the beginning. There in Genesis 1, we learn that God creates the human race in His image, male and female, and blesses us with the ability to procreate. In other words, He designed us for heterosexuality. And it doesn't take the Bible or rocket scientists to figure that out. And, and it's true that there are heterosexual couples who are barren, but their relationship doesn't violate God's design. Then in Genesis 2, we see that God didn't want Adam, the first man, to be alone. So he decided to make him a suitable helper, not just a companion, but a helper. Why? Because only with Eve would Adam be complete and able to reproduce. And how did he make Eve? He took her out of Adam's rib or side, which is why Adam said that she would be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then note this, the scripture says that through marriage, the two become one. That's because they once were one, the woman taken out of the man. There's unique complementarity between them biologically and spiritually and emotionally. That's why man plus man or woman plus woman can never equal man plus woman. In response, some gay theologians ask, well, if homosexuality is so important, why does the Bible mention it so infrequently? Uh, but you see, they're looking at this exactly the opposite way. They're looking at it backwards. It's because God designed us for heterosexuality that there's so few references to homosexuality. In other words, every single reference in the Bible to marriage, family, and relationships presupposes heterosexuality, as in the Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother, and Paul's directives to husbands and wives. In a same-sex relationship, who's the husband and who's the wife? Also, we note that there's not one single positive reference to homosexuality in the Bible, whereas every single reference to it is decidedly negative. As we move on to Leviticus, we see that there were some laws God gave Israel to keep them separate from the nations, like the dietary laws. And then there were other laws God gave that applied to all people, like do not murder. As for homosexual practice in Leviticus, God calls it detestable, and it doesn't get any less detestable if you do it over and over with the same person. When we come to the New Testament and the teaching of Jesus, he really didn't need to address this because first century Jewish teaching clearly forbade homosexual practice. Yet, in three different ways, Jesus did address this. First, in Matthew 5, Jesus said that he didn't come to abolish the law of the prophets, but to fulfill. And when it came to the moral laws of the Torah, he fulfilled them by taking them to an even higher standard. Second, in Matthew 15, Jesus taught that all sexual acts committed outside of marriage defiled. And then in Matthew 19, he taught that marriage as God intended it from the beginning was one man and one woman together for life. Coming to the teachings of Paul in Romans 1, we, we see that because of God's judgment on the human race, we were given over to idolatry and sexual promiscuity and homosexuality with males and females exchanging natural sexual relationships for unnatural sexual relationships. And, and when Paul talks about natural sexual relationships, he's talking about natural as God created us in Genesis chapter 1. Then in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says that those who willingly give themselves to homosexuality, along with a number of other sins, would not inherit the kingdom of God. And in fact, Paul's teaching is so clear that one lesbian scholar, Bernadette Bruton, says, I see Paul as condemning all forms of homoeroticism. But Paul didn't stop there. 
He also wrote, that's what some of you once were, but God forgave you and transformed you. That's because Jesus died for homosexual sins the same way he died for heterosexual sins. As for the notion that Moses or Jesus or Paul didn't know about long-term committed same-sex relationships, the fact is they spoke and wrote by the inspiration of the Spirit. Not only so, but Jesus, the Son of God, could look into the heart of every human being. Surely he understood the struggles of someone with same-sex attractions, and yet he didn't affirm them where they were. He offered them transformation. So rather than put homosexual practice into a special category, as if it's the worst of all sins, or as if God is fine with it, put it where it belongs like other sins, but one for which Jesus died. And rather than finding your identity in your romantic attractions and sexual desires, find your identity in Jesus. That way, rather than interpreting the scriptures through the lens of your sexuality, you can interpret your sexuality through the lens of the scriptures. We know that none of these life-transforming messages would be possible without your help. So we encourage you to share this message with someone that you care about. Anyway, so that was the... That was the video, and the most recent guy that went after it, uh, he, he's, he plays a lot of it, and then he comments on it, and he, he has this level. Did he say women are helpers? Women are helpers? So all these people are flooding the YouTube, you know, challenging me on that same point. Of course, in context, we need each other to fulfill God's commission. So you can... On YouTube, give it a thumbs up, share it with your other friends. And if you get the thumb drive that Stephen Black's ministry has been talking about with tons and tons of resources, that's on there as well. But it's on our YouTube channel, Ask Dr. Brown, Can You Be Gay and Christian? So all that to say that this has been talked about on website after website after website. The fact that, that our ad played and one from ADF got covered by Business Insider and Forbes magazine. I mean, you think it's this massive thing that's happened. And now it's ongoing. They're all talking about it as if it's happened. It happened a few weeks ago and stopped. We haven't advertised. In fact, YouTube won't allow us to advertise it anymore. What do you know? But, but the fact is, what looked like something bad and negative... And this, you know, wild attack ends up getting the video showed in places we never could have gotten it showed and well over a million times. And, and God knows, even though it's being mocked and little pieces taken out, God knows how many people watch it and get hit with conviction. God knows how many are struggling and think, okay, I'm just getting away from this now. Getting away from the Bible and getting away from this God stuff. And then they go to this um, place, you know, to watch some guy's, you know, trans testimony or things like that. And there it comes on. Again, it wasn't our intent. So I, I look at a lot of things happening. Like right now, the, the outrageous law they're trying to pay, pass in California. There are actually two bills, completely outrageous. That, that it, is, it is finally awakening many Christians throughout California. I, I just got a, an email from a medical doctor last night working with one of the most influential churches in, in California. And he said, Christians are waking up. They're taking a stand. And sometimes I wonder... If the best thing that could happen is that that law gets passed in California. And, and, and the law would say it is illegal, not just for minors, it is illegal for anyone to, to get professional help with unwanted same-sex attraction or gender confusion. I mean, completely outrageous. Sometimes I think the best thing is let it pass. And then finally Christians will start to say, okay, we're going to do what's right, period. Sometimes, unfortunately, we have to get pushed too far before we wake up. I believe the tide will turn. I can't guarantee that, but I firmly believe it. And it's because of overreach and things going too far and things just not being fair and just not being right and the pendulum swinging way beyond what anyone wanted. And, and then the other thing is that, that, you know, one of the newest phenomena now, you're seeing it more and more and more, is drag queens reading to toddlers. More and more commonly happening. You're not allowed to take issue with that. It's like, okay, it's one thing when here's a guy and he's attracted to another guy. And they, they love each other and they, you know, they want to commit their lives to each other and adopt a, you know, a handicapped child. And, you know, you, you want to be affirming. You don't want to be bigoted. And, you know, that's how a lot of society looks at it. They don't recognize the, the fundamental disorder of the relationship or the wrongness in God's sight or the societal implications. 
But those same people that want to be affirming of that didn't plan on a drag queen reading to their two-year-old at the library. And, and recently, was it in Canada? It happened that, that a pastor, or Alaska maybe, a pastor went in and, and while these, these drag queens were reading to the toddlers and, and started saying there's no such thing as transgender and started speaking against it. So he's written up as the bad guy and the drag queens are having to comfort the kids. And of course, the ruling just yesterday in Canada, seven to two decision of the Supreme Court against Trinity Western University. This is a respected university with, I think, 40 undergraduate programs and 17 graduate programs. When their law school was birthed some years ago, because they have a Christian covenant, so students and faculty must live by this Christian covenant, and the Christian covenant says that you have to live in various godly ways you're called to, in, in, including no sexual relationships outside of marriage, which is defined as male and female, despite Canadian law. So the law school came under attack, and, and, and the rule was it was discriminatory. The other schools didn't come under attack, but the law school did, and that the students graduating would not be allowed to practice law in Canada. So the decision got over, overturned by a regional court, but the Supreme Court voted 7-2 to two yesterday against Trinity. And their law school, the degrees will not be accredited because they hold to Christian standards. Complete outrage, but the thing we've been warning about for years. That's what we tell people. There's a reason we've been shouting these things out. There's a reason we've been on the front lines. But ultimately, these things that look so dire and dark will, will end up having a, a holy pushback. And this could be the thing that gets Christians on their knees praying. This could be the thing that, that gets people looking to reach out. Number one, the foundation of our hope, our courage, our strength is that Jesus is risen from the dead. Number two, Everything that Satan or society or circumstances mean for evil, God can turn for good. Romans 8.28 remains an eternal truth. That if we love God, those who love God are called according to his purpose. That, that God causes all things to work for our good. So, yeah, a lot of stuff happens that's painful, that's negative, And you know that, that it, it's costing lives and, 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 and it's bringing pain. Yes, but look beyond that. And I, that's what I'm always wondering, how's God going to turn this for good? How's God going to turn this for good? What's the redemptive side of this? And, and then thirdly, last point, I want to speak in particular to those of you who struggle with same-sex attraction or gender confusion or, or some other type of disordered condition in your own heart or life. I've, I've never struggled in these same areas. When I was asked to be on Tyra Banks some years ago to, to talk about transgender children, I said, you understand, I've got a PhD in Semitic languages. I'm not a psychologist or, you know, psychotherapist. I, that's not my background. So, so again, God called me in to stand with you and, and be a support and be a help. But I, I want to give you a major reason for hope and courage, which is you're here. You say, what does that mean? I mean, if all the lies the devil's been telling you for years were true and real, you wouldn't be here today. If, if, if the enemy was as powerful as he alleges and you were as weak as he alleges, you'd be gone a long time ago. You know, I've, I've had students come in over the years in our ministry school. <clears throat> Maybe someone will say, you know, Dr. Brown, I just, I'm so ashamed. I feel terrible. You know, I used to be addicted to porn before I was saved. And, and last night, I, just, I, I, I watched them for like 10 minutes. I've just been grieving over it and weeping. And, and I feel so miserable. Uh, of course, we want to minister to them and help them where they are. But I also want to encourage them, hey, you shut the thing off. And, and you're grieving over it. In the old days, you used to watch it and not even think twice. You're a different person. The, the, the reason that you have a conscience is because God's working in you. The reason that when you, you messed up six months ago that, that you felt so miserable about it is because you're not living in sin and enjoying it anymore. You're a new person. And, and God who began the work in you is the one who's going to bring it to completion. All right, look, if someone looks me in the eyes and said, I'm leaving God. I hate God. I want nothing to do with God. I'm rebelling against God. I want to live my own life. Obviously, that's going to deeply concern me. Obviously, that's, that's going to be something that, that gets me in prayer. And brings deep concern. But look, if your heart is to follow God, he's going to keep you. If, if, if you want to live for God, 
if you want your life to be pleasing in his sight, he's going to keep you. And, and over the years, you know, I get bombarded by lies by anyone else. And I began to realize that, that those lies were the opposite of God's truth. And, and that one thing I do, I actually have a, a, a little file where I, I keep some of the, the worst and ugliest attacks that, that come my way. And I, I do it to, to encourage myself. Everybody's different. <laughs> my, my team, I've got my assistant Dylan here with me. They'll tell you, when they find a website attacking me or a video attacking me or an article attacking me, they, they send it to me to encourage me. <laughs> and for me, it's a sign we're doing right. If it's because of my foolishness or self-righteousness or hypocrisy, I'd be grieving over it. But if it's for the truth, so be it. Let it be. And, and even from the, the thousands of comments flooding in to Can You Be Gay and Christian to the video, I'm just pulling out some of the more outlandish ones just for archives. And I, I feel bad for the people attacking me because I want to be a friend to them. I want to help them. But, but one thing I've realized is, is that the words that are spoken are the exact opposite of what God is saying. So you need to take some of those words and turn them around the other way. You know, when the enemy comes whispering to you, you're going to fall. You're not going to make it. You say, thank you, Jesus, for an encouragement that I'm going to make it, that you're with me, that I'm strong. God helped me change my lifestyle about four years ago and got rid of all the unhealthy things I ate my entire life and now just eat super healthy only always. And I'm, I'm literally getting younger by the year. I know my hair is gray, but I'm literally getting younger by the year in terms of life expectancy and health and vitality. I'm thinking, that's probably because of the constant death wishes I get. You know, it's just day and night death wishes and die, old man. Sometimes they'll say, we want you to die of pancreatic cancer. And I'll just write back, you didn't spell pancreatic correctly. I think, I think this is what you actually meant. So, so, so listen, listen. The devil is a liar. Now, some of you were thinking, wait a second. You're supposed to be this educated guy and you teach at all these seminaries and your, your first point is Jesus is risen and your second and your last point is the devil's a liar. Yeah, l listen, listen. These are profoundly deep and wonderful truths. And, and, and if we take hold of them, here, again, let me ask you a question. If all the lies you've heard from the devil, those of you who struggled, those of you who've come out of homosexuality, those of you who've come out of a transgender identity or bisexuality, whatever it is, and you're here listening to me right now. That is positive proof that the lies Satan told you last month and last year aren't true. And, and the fact that you want to please God, the fact that at your lowest you're saying, oh God, help me, that proves that you are a different person. When I first got saved, I heard about this famous evangelist in the 40s and 50s. And he came from a nominal Jewish home. So Jewish enough to not believe in Jesus, but not a religious Jew in any way. And he was also profane, just on a regular basis, profanity would flood out of his mouth. And he got wonderfully born again. And before he knew what happened, it was the next day he was, he was at work. And, and he was hammering some nails in and hit his thumb, smashed his thumb and shouted out, hallelujah. And everyone at work like, what happened to you? And that's what he realized. I, I guess I'm born again. I mean, he had prayed and asked the Lord into his heart. He didn't realize how changed he was. And then the next day he's in the grocery store and he's, he's getting a can of, you know, tomato paste or something like that. And he holds it up and he begins weeping because the red reminds him of the blood of Jesus. He realizes, okay, I'm, I'm a changed person. Now, now look, you know, sometimes there's the joke, you, you tell people, okay, don't think about elephants for the next hour, and I'll give you $1,000. So what's the only thing you think? Don't think about elephants. Don't think, elephants. can't think about elephants. In the same way, some of us are so focused on our battle, our issues, our struggles, our shortcomings, that, that, that we, we lose sight of God's keeping power and God's victory. And I had a friend many years ago, I'm thinking this was in the early 1980s, and before he was a believer, he was a heroin addict. 
And now he was saved. He, he often had a raging temper he had to learn to deal with. And God was helping him there. But he'd been addicted to cigarettes for years and years and years. And we were ministering about freedom in the Lord. And, and something got hold of him. And he recognized, okay, I've died to sin. I can't live in it any longer. This is destructive habit. I shouldn't be walking in this. I died to sin. I've been raised up. I'm righteous in God. I'm an overcomer. And he said the day after I prayed for him and he got that, that revelation, he said he smoked more cigarettes than he ever had in his entire life. And after every cigarette, he, he put it out and said, I'm free in Jesus' name. It looked like a fool. And he smoked another. I don't know how many packs he went through that day and then never smoked after that. Sometimes you have these battles and it looks like, man, I collapsed. But then here you are. Why? Because God's at work in you. And, and, and you need to lean on his grace and not your ability. Do I have time for one more real quick story? Okay. Some years back when our daughters were little, a friend in Virginia said, hey, Mike, we've got this beautiful summer house on a, on a lake, this big man-made lake here, and, and why don't you and Nancy and the kids go down there. We'll stock the refrigerator for you. Just have it enjoyed, and then we'll come down there after a few days, and we'll go out water skiing and things like that. Okay, great. So they come down, and now we're going to go water skiing. And I had tried it once when I was like 15. I was probably in my late 20s. Didn't succeed when I was 15, just real quick one day. So now we're going to go out. Well, I, I was lifting weights a decent amount, plus I was heavier then. And, and th they only had a medium vest, so the vest was really squeezing me. It was really it was kind of biting in. It was tight. So I was going to go first. And, and he said, look, let the boat do the work. Let the boat pull you up. The boat does the work. So I thought, okay, let the boat do the work. And he pulling me. So I'm holding back, I, you know, let the boat pull me up. So I'm, I'm actually holding back with all my might, you know, and... and I'm, it's over and over and over trying, and I can't, I can't get up. I can't get up. Finally, as I'm getting back into the boat, you know, the, the boat's just idling. I, I cut my foot on the propeller. So, I, you know, I crawl in the boat. I'm completely, my body is completely exhausted. I take the vest off. I'm just completely red. My foot's bleeding. I thought, it's a great, lovely summer vacation here. So Nancy's up next, and she's in her shorts and T-shirt, just, you know, modest outfit. And she gets up there, and, and boom, instantly, first time, just instantly. It's like, how'd she do that? And then our, you know, older daughter, maybe she's like six or seven then, I don't know. And she, boom, she's straight up. And then our younger daughter, maybe five, or maybe they're each a little younger, she was so little that you couldn't see her with the, with the waves, you know, with the wake. She's up instantly. It's like, how in the world? And I couldn't do it. Next day, they got a bigger vest than me. I felt better. The same thing. Can't get, can't. Single time. Don't make it. So some months later, next year, got a veterinarian friend on Long Island. And he says, hey, Mike, you want to go out water skiing? I said, yeah, I tried. I couldn't do it. He goes, well, let's go out. So the same deal. It's not happening. It's not happening. So he's determined. He's a thinking guy. He says, all right, we're going to figure this out. So he has his wife drive, and he's watching. And he goes, Mike, it looks like you're, you're trying to hold back the boat. I said, well, yeah, they said, let the boat do the work. Let the boat pull you up. He goes, no, no, no. When the boat pulls, you stand. I said, oh, so I, he said, yeah, when the boat pulls, because I was waiting for the boat to pull me up. He said, when the boat pulls, you stand. And next thing's like, it's a miracle. It's just, woo, I'm going, by, I'm, I can't believe it. It seemed really at that point like a miracle. And I'd lean left and go, whoa, I'd lean right. It's like, I can't believe this. And I stayed up, you know, just till my legs got a little tired. It's like, I literally felt like a miracle. And, and yeah, the boat's doing all the work, but you just, you just like cooperate with it. And next thing you're, it's a miracle. So I, I just want to encourage you. Listen, when I gave up chocolate, I was a lifelong chocoholic. Okay, August 24th of 2014. <laughs> December 17th, 71, that's when I said I'll never put a needle in my arm again. Listen to me. It was far easier for me to give up the needle and heroin than to give up chocolate. God is my witness. I went through three days of miserable withdrawal for all the foods I was addicted to. I used to have Oreos for breakfast as a boy, okay. I was a lifelong, you know, pizza-holic and just... All this unhealthy, it wasn't a glutton, just unhealthy eating. And I, I've asked people, I said, let me, let me ask you a question. 
If I told you four years ago, which is more likely, there will be a sweeping national revival in America, or Donald Trump will be the next president? <laughs> you all would have said sweeping revival in America. Okay, now we take it one step further. Which is more likely, there will be a sweeping revival in America, or Donald Trump will be the next president, elected mainly by white evangelicals because of his stance as a pro-life champion? Like, what? You wouldn't even write that in a silly movie or book. I mean, watching the news the other day and Trump meeting with the head of North Korea and Dennis Rodman, it's like, who would have written this thing? Who would imagine this? But anyone that knows me, if I said, which would have been more likely? That scenario with Donald Trump and moving the embassy to Jerusalem and all this stuff, like him or hate him, just all this stuff, or I will become the poster boy for healthy eating. Everyone would say Donald Trump. Everybody, everyone that knew me, easy, hands down. It's a complete joke. My wife and I wrote a book, Breaking the Stronghold of Food. It's, it's crazy. But, but there, what I'm saying is God gives grace. And when you just kind of learn to cooperate with it, he does, he does carry you. He does impossible things through you. So it's like, okay, you fell, you messed up. Just lean on him because he's able to finish what he started. And the devil's a liar. And here you are. And you want to serve God, and you want to live for God, and there's actually hope in your heart. The devil wants to steal that hope. And that's the key thing. Let that hope always be there. That's the flame of God burning inside of you. And you will rejoice forever and ever in his presence. And you will experience blessing in your life in the midst of struggles and challenges. You will experience the goodness and the grace of God. He is faithful. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Lord.